we're going. Okay, let's hope we don't have any more technical hiccups. First off, we'll do a little bit of business. Um, we'll look at uh, our new members. Do we have, while we're looking at new members, have we got any new members in the audience today? I know we're seeing one, which I've introduced. And because we have one, I'm going to go through the spiel one more time. So I hope you enjoy it each time I do this. Welcome to the society. Um, this is our general meeting. It's open to the public as well as members. Um, it's not the best place to actually meet new members or get um, into astronomy. I'd invite you to come along to one of our club nights. When you get your information pack, it will uh, outline a lot of the activities that we do. Feel free to join some of the sections um, and partake in their operations because that's where you'll get the most knowledge from. We have Friday nights, the first Friday and the last Friday at our Burwood premises. Uh, you'll get the address when you get your information pack. That's a great way to start. We have a person there that will welcome you and give you all the information you need to get the most out of society. All right, um, we're going to move straight on to our guest speaker. Uh, we have with us tonight Professor Jeff Cook. From, he's the ARC Future Fellow and Chief Investigator of the Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery and Centre for Astrophysics and Supercomputing. He's based out at Swinburne. And I have a whole lot of other stuff here, but I think it might be best if we let Jeff talk to you about all that. So, Jeff. Thanks for that. So that's a, that's a lot of words going along with my name, right? Center of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery and et cetera. But anyhow, I am, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from the US. I, am a, I work at Swinburne. And it's been really an exciting, interesting uh, position there. I've had a great time. And that center has grown enormously over the last couple decades. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about a pro one of the programs that I lead. It looks for the fastest bursts in the universe. And these things are milliseconds to hours long. So some of them are so fast, they're faster than you just blink your eyes. They're very fast. And it's a very challenging program, as you'll see, and requires a lot of telescopes. So I'll be showing you a lot of pictures of telescopes, but I think you probably don't mind, right? OK, so it's. Uh, it's a program that remarkably has grown into the largest astronomical collaboration in the world. And you'll see that in a bit. And it's just run from right across town here at Swinburne. We're led, led there. Uh, you're just being entertained by a supernova right now. But anyhow, <laughs> um, so let's see if this thing works. Oh, I have to plug something in, don't I? Hang on. No, I just need that to make it work. Uh, just a moment here. There we go. Okay, so it's a it's an all wavelength, all messenger. Sorry, this thing is. I'm having some technical difficulties here. Maybe I'm too far away. Yeah, all wavelength, all messenger, real-time, complete, FATS transient program. And that's a lot of words, but you'll see by the end of this talk what that all means. So if I can get this to work, I have a feeling it, things are going to be delayed. All right, that's going to be, I'll just start talking and hope this catches up. So when you look in the universe, uh, a lot of you have, you know, look through telescopes, you, you've imaged the universe, you've loved the universe, and you'll see uh, 
a lot of things in the sky, including, which will show up here in a second, a galaxy, which is a Sene. And I hope, yeah, this is, uh, hopefully this isn't too problematic. Hmm. Apologies, I'm gonna make sure I can get this working. All right. Anyway, this is Sene, and it hopefully it doesn't advance from here. So what do you see in this image? You look at this image and you see a galaxy. That's interesting, and from the image alone, you can make out a lot of things. You get the size of the galaxy, the shape, you know, there's more stars or light in the middle, and then it gets less towards the outsides. You can see this interesting dust lane, so that's interesting, right? And you learn some things about the galaxy. You also can tell that, you know, the stars are older, there aren't really blue stars, that would be young stars, or at least massive stars. And you get some information out of that, but as we all know, you know, there's more wavelengths than optical that tell us about objects in the sky. And this is the full electroma electromagnetic spectrum, you know, gamma ray, x-ray, ultraviolet, right, down to radio. So, if you image this galaxy in other wavelengths, you will see, oh, the wheel's turning, you'll see a lot more information. If you look at the x-ray here, this is that galaxy, and you can see this uh, jet that's sticking out here that you wouldn't see in the optical, and this tells us that there's a supermassive black hole in the center, so you learn something new just because you imaged an x-ray. The UV tells you where massive stars are, uh, are, are residing and, and, and hot stars. This is the optical again, and then if you look in the infrared, you can see where the dust is, and that shows you this nice uh, shape Fig, uh, this uh, warped disk looking thing here, and you're actually looking, the galaxy looks more transparent, and that actually helps indicate that this is probably a galaxy merger, because this could be a, the remnants of a galaxy that crashed into it. In the radio, you can see these giant lobes, and in the, in the H1, which is also radio, you can learn where the cool gas is and where stars will form. So if you merge a few of those together, you get a much better picture of the object you're looking at. So that's gonna be a theme of this talk, that multiple wavelengths tell you a lot more about the objects than just looking in the optical or in one wavelength. I'm not used to reaching. So the, all the wavelengths are emitted by these things, but they don't all make it to the ground. So this is Earth and space up here. And as most of you know, gamma rays and X-rays and a lot of the ultraviolet don't make it down to the ground because our atmosphere blocks them. They interact with the molecules. And thankfully, otherwise, we'd probably have you know a lot of uh, UV sun, you know, it's damaging to the human skin, etc. And then the uh, optical makes it to the ground. Some of the infrared doesn't, doesn't. And then you have the uh, radio window. We have radio making it to the ground. So that's why most of the telescopes, well, all the telescopes you see on the ground, essentially are either optical or radio. So that's going to be important as well because if we're going to try to monitor fast transients with uh, multiple wavelengths, we have to have some in telescopes on the ground and some in space, right? and trying to figure this out. Is it this thing that's doing it? Okay. Sorry, I apologize for the jumpiness here. All right, so when you look in the night sky, you know, everything seems static, right? Stars are there, everything's not changing, the unchanging universe, but you know, if you have a uh, sensitive enough telescope, things are exploding and bursting all over the place in the universe, and the, and the, and the the effort here is to check, is to, to detect these and to detect these transients, these transient events. And as, uh, amateur astronomers have been fantastic in con contributing to this field because they've you know, discovered many, many supernovae, novae, et cetera, so there's been enormous contribution to science in the field of transient astronomy. So if we look at this plot here of transients, on the x-axis, these are days, so a time how long the, the, the event evolves, and this is one day, 10 days, 100 days, so it's a log scale. And this is brightness, right? So faint to bright. And we look at this plot, so it's around 2005, this plot was made, and what was known mostly were supernovae. No, no surprise, these are these type 1a supernovae, which we'll talk about a little more. And these are core collapse supernovae. These are deaths of massive stars. And then there's classical novae. So that's, that's great, and that's the transient universe that a lot of people think of when they think of transients. However, large format CCDs came into existence and the skies were surveyed in great detail and found a lot more th other things. There were these super luminous supernovae, some calcium rich, some weird faint luminous supernovae down here, and all kinds of different types of supernovae and events and novae. And the point here is that with enough time, all of this area is getting filled in. There are things at any time and there are things at any luminosity. Nature 
works where it fills up that whole space with different phenomena and different physics behind them. And so our question was, okay, this is nice. We made this plot. What about over here? Do things happen on shorter and shorter timescales? And in the past, this hasn't been probed very much because it's just technologically difficult. We've come, now we have supercomputers and machine learning and all these different things that have evolved that enable us to do that. So we take this plot and just kind of squish it all to one side, like that. We ask the question, is there anything here of interest? And now we're looking at things that are like one second or 10 seconds and seconds long here, hours long here and days on this time frame. And the answer is yes, there's a lot of stuff. This is chock full of interesting things. Anywhere from uh, X-ray outbursts and flare stars to kilonovae, which are uh, grav uh, no uh, neutron stars merging, to core collapse supernova shock breakouts, all kinds of things, and fast rate outbursts, et cetera. So many of these are theorized, but some of them have been serendipitously discovered. People just kind of stumbled into them and found them. So there's some evidence of different ones of these. So this program we're going to talk about is to search for these things in a very systematic and, and effective way. When you look into X, that was optical, by the way. When you look into X-ray wavelengths, you see that same time scale. It's a different plot, but the same kind of time scale here is also chock full of things. So there are many, many transients in the X-ray as well. And you look in the radio, many, many things. And I don't expect you to read all of this, but basically there's a lot of stuff filling up the plot is the takeaway. And so at all of the wavelengths, whenever you look at them, there's a lot of transients that happen on a very fast time scale, but we don't know that much about them because they're just really fast and they're gone quickly and you don't capture the information. So I'll start with the, like a kind of a tour really quick of the transients just to get you familiar with some of these transients, what they are and why do we care, and then I'll tell you about our program. So when you see this picture, what do you think of? Some people might think of, you know, some sporting activity or picnic or hike. I think of transients, okay? Because <laughs> Right here in this picture is the sun, and the sun, in a way, is a tran has transient behavior. And what I mean by that is it um, has solar flares and solar eruptions. And as you can see here, the sun's surface, when filmed over time, nice roiling surface, but then you get these big bursts. And as you can tell, this is the size of the Earth to scale. So that's a very big burst, and it happens very quickly. And these bursts are very energetic. They also are caused by that advance. Hard to know. They're also, also caused by um, magnetic field lines coming out of the surface and, and they uh, launch a lot of material out, as you'll see here, into space. And that material can go out. It's ionized material that can go out. And if it aims towards Earth and is strong enough, it can take out satellites, as we know, or it can affect our you know, electronic communications, so it has some effect. So it's important. And but this is just the sun, and the sun is a very, very tame star. But it, but eruptions like this can actually change the brightness of the sun by a measurable amount because it just gets brighter during these these eruptions. So that's interesting. All right. So other stars in the universe are much more active than the sun. Some cool stars are so eruptive, they have flares that change the brightness of that star by a thousand times in just a minute or two. So imagine our sun a thousand times brighter in like two minutes. Not so good for the population on Earth, right? And that could, that could just sterilize life on planets in there. So we care about that because if we find these things and they happen all the time, say, then planets and other stars are gonna have a hard time having life, for example. So it's just an interesting one application to, to study these. Also, this is a UV image of the sky. It's not pretty, sorry, but it's from a, a space satellite and this is ultraviolet image of the sky and some stars like that one has a flare. This is actually a double flare. And you can see its brightness now is really faint, but it gets quite a lot brighter just from the flare. And this is just another version of that in a better uh, zoomed in. All right, so that's a flare star. Then there's um, other stars like that pulsate. They're variable stars, which many of you know about. This is a Cepheid variable. Um, and you see it pulsating, right? So it pulsates and it changes its brightness considerably. And that's just a phase in its life. And, it, and these things can pulsate and change their brightness quite a bit. And if it's a faint star, that brightness change can be detected as somewhat of a, as a transient. But when you look at this, this will loop. When you look at this a little careful, more carefully, you see these like waves going out, right? Can you see those? Now that's not wind or anything, this is space, right? 
what you're seeing is actually light echoes. So the brightness reflects off of this material as it goes out. The speed of light is just traveling along like this. And so you're actually seeing the light echoing off of material as it's pulsating. So that's pretty cool, right? So you can watch that going out. So something out here, would that would pulsate, but it takes a long time for that light to eventually get out that far. OK, so that's, that's a variable star. And there's many, many types other than this are Lyrae, Zeti, et cetera. And, and many of you in this audience know a lot about them. Uh, there's also stars that are much more disruptive or eruptive. And this is a case, uh, I think this is 838 Monosteros, uh, the unicorn, right? And so uh, this is a star that erupted like this. And, and it was also observed by amateur astronomers. Quite a show, and it's uh, still unclear what it was, but it could possibly be actually a merger of two stars causing this eruption. So that's an interesting event, and it gets much, much brighter and bigger. And then um, also in this kind of category, um, I've included Nobi. So this is a white dwarf star, which is the core of a star like the sun after it dies. And then this is a, a, another star that's a nearby in a binary system. This is usually a, a giant star. And they're so close that the gravity of this white dwarf pulls material off onto the disk. And as that material creeps onto the disk, some of it falls onto the star. And if enough of it falls on the surface, it'll start thermonuclear action and explode into not complete explosion to the star, but it bursts and causes a much brighter explosion. And sometimes there's multiple bursts. And that material goes out into space. And that star changes quite a bit. And it's a transient. And this is actually an ultraviolet image of a star that's done that that is evidence of that. So these type of variables you know we are needed for future surveys. And there's something called the Large Synoptic uh, Survey Telescope, which is being built. And there are other telescopes that are planned to scan the sky in great detail. And they're going to come up with millions and millions of these things. So we need to understand them and find out, you know, map them and catalog them. Then are the ones that we talked about before, a little more common, which are supernovae. But in this case, this is an extreme, or a, another example of basically what I just told you about, the nova. This is a, this is a type 1a supernova, and these things get as bright as, nearly as bright as the galaxy, their host galaxy. But in this case, you have that same situation with a white dwarf and uh, a companion, and it's the material is getting ripped off. But if the rate is fast enough and enough material lands on it, and the mass of that exceeds the Chandrasekhar mass, the whole thing explodes into a type 1a supernova, complete detonation of that, of that white dwarf. Now, the bursts of that, when these things explode, that material actually can hit that companion star and affect it, because it's a nearby companion star. And you can actually get bursts of that companion star from that interaction. And we look for those things, because that helps us understand that, number one, there was a companion star, because these are so far away, you don't always know that. And then you can understand more about the physics involved. So that's another interesting fast transient. Then there are just uh, massive stars that make supernovae, very massive stars, as most know, is like maybe 8 to 25 solar masses go through their lives, and then once they exhaust the fuel in, inside of them, they um, erupt into a supernova, a core collapse supernova like this one. And this is just a, a computer simulation. So the thing explodes extremely brightly, and then the material, most of its envelope is ejected into space, and all of the elements that were synthesized during that explosion, a lot of he heavy elements that we know and love and what we're made of here today were made during these supernova explosions, like you know carbon, nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, I don't know, iron, and iron, and all kinds of things get ejected into these, these clouds, and then they cool and form the next generation of stars and planets. But the burst itself happens inside the star. The core collapses, and the supernova starts to explode. And it's inside the star for a while, and we don't know that it's a supernova until it reaches the surface. But once it reaches the surface, there's this big burst shock breakout. That's happens, and then it becomes the supernova that you saw it. And we're searching for these shock breakouts. And they're fast. They can only they can be you know, minutes to hours. And also, some of the most massive uh, supernovae are detected in gamma ray, like this. So a very bright gamma ray burst, which, which can last you know, seconds to minutes. And that's when very massive stars explode. Sometimes they emit uh, jets of gamma ray radiation. And all of these occur all over the universe, but if they happen to be, when they explode, if they happen to be oriented such that that ray is pointing towards the Earth, we see that gamma ray light. And so you detect it in gamma ray. And so supernova could be detected in other wavelengths like gamma ray as well. And there's this afterglow. After the supernova explosions, and you see the gamma ray 
there's this fade in many, many wavelengths of the, of the event, and that tells us an enormous amount about the physics and what happened and its distance, et cetera. So when you have a supernova explosion, what's left? Well, the core can either be a neutron star, which is maybe you know, two times the mass of our sun compacted into a tiny area like the size of Melbourne, so a very, very compact object, which warps space and is nothing but a ball of neutrons, or even more massive stars collapse into a black hole. And so these are the, the uh, outcomes, or the end products of those supernovae. Um, part of the gravitational wave center, we study binary systems of things, say these are two black holes. When they orbit, each of them are warping space, and as they orbit, they emit gravitational waves, which decay their orbits, so they get closer and closer, and then they merge into one, and then it's just spinning, sitting there spinning, no more gravitational waves. Now when the black holes merge, we don't see any light. At least all of the ones that we've followed up so far, we haven't seen any light come out of these things. They're just black holes that make a two little ones make a bigger one. So not very interesting in the light universe, but you know, it, it, we'll keep searching. Maybe they, they will emit something in certain situations. But if you have two neutron stars, which is the other outcome, those also emit gravitational waves. Their orbits decay because they're losing that energy. And then when they merge, it's completely the opposite. You get an, an incredible show of light. And you get it in every single wavelength, gamma ray, x-ray, UV, optical, radio, et cetera. These are called kilonovae, and they are amazing. And we've detected one a couple years ago. Uh, the gravitational waves were detected. And, and about uh, 70 telescopes all over the world over several weeks covered this thing more than any event ever. This has the most coverage of anything ever. And our group at Swinburne actually were about 20% of those telescopes. So we were heavily involved in this discovery and we learned about this, the kilonova and we are learning more and more about all these new kilonova that are being detected. We are trying to find their counterpart like this one. This is the kilonova and its evolution over time. We have yet to find another one even though about three or so good candidates have been found by gravitational waves. We've searched and searched and haven't found a compelling candidate yet, but we continue. But what you'll also notice is this is a light curve, so this is time in days on the bottom here, and this is brightness, so bright to faint. And these things rise really fast, like in minutes to hours in brightness, and then they fade relatively fast, especially in the blue filters. This could be just a couple days it fades, or maybe a couple of weeks if you're in an infrared. These are infrared bands up here, and this is the optical. So these are quickly evolving things, so also fast transients, but they're kind of on the slow end of fast transients. And on the opposite extreme are fast radio bursts. So this is the, I'll conclude with this one on my survey. These are bursts that are detected in the radio that last about a millisecond or a few milliseconds. They occur quite often in the universe, but they're just this burst at a random location and you just hope you're pointing where it happens, otherwise you're gonna miss it. So, you know, most of them are missed. So if you do a search, you could search the sky for about 400 hours and then you might find one. So they're, they're hard, they're pretty elusive. And so they, they've happened and no one has yet found a counterpart to that. Like, haven't, they haven't detected any other wavelength because it's just hard to do and you'll see why. And then of course, when you're doing fast transits, there's just the unknown. We've been finding unknown things. This is a fast radio burst detection. So what you see here is time and this is in milliseconds. So zero, one second, and about one and a half seconds. And then this is wavelengths. It would be short wavelengths here to long wavelengths. That's the burst being detected through. If you make a cut, you see that it's just a few milliseconds long, but it's being detected in different wavelengths over time, over this like second or so. And what you, to take away from this plot is that if you had a telescope measuring this wavelength, you detect it at this time. But if you had a telescope with a shorter wave, you detect it before that. And these are radio wavelengths, but if we want to find it, say an optical or infrared or any other shorter wavelength, we're looking at way up here somewhere. Oops, there's the wrong one. <laughs> and um, sorry about that. And did it advance? Not sure what I pushed. So we'd be looking way up here somewhere. And the, the difficulty here is, if you want to find a counterpart to a fast radio burst, you have to predict where it's going to be and actually be there before it happens. That starts to get tough. Okay, and that's part of this game. Okay, 
So that's the setup. <laughs> okay, so here's uh, talking about our program. So conventional transient searches, just looking for transients in the sky, what have they done? Well, most of them have been supernovae and novae, and with supernovae, like this one, you know, it gets brighter and then it fades. And, and here's how long it takes. It takes many, many days. So you've got plenty of time to deal with this. Maybe take a couple observations, check your result, send it off to some other telescope, it gets some observations. You've got some days here to work with. It's not too bad. And usually what they do is they image um, a, different, a whole bunch of galaxies in the sky or areas of the sky. They just image them and they say, I'll come back a few days later or a week later to see if anything's changed. And if it has changed, it could be a supernova. And you compare the two images like this, before and after, and you see that there's a supernova happening. So that's kind of the concept. But you have days and weeks to work with. Then you want to take a spectrum of it. In this case, this is that kilonova again. This is the kilonova, and you send the light through a spectrograph, and you can learn a whole bunch of information. And in the case of the kilonova, we learn a lot in all the different elements that were evolved or synthesized, including gold and platinum, et cetera. And we learn about uh, all the physics going on with the, the remnant and the disks and all the merging. A lot of information comes out of that. But you can take different spectra, which is this is wavelength from like blue to red here. And this is brightness. And the spectra tell you distance and all this information I was telling you about. So the spectra are very important, but you need to know where the object is to get a spectrum, because you have to point the telescope to get that spectrum. So you have to find it, then analyze it, identify that that's actually what you want, tell a telescope that has a spectrograph, they go over, get it, and you have to do this in like seconds or minutes. So it becomes a really challenge. OK, so with conventional ones, usually supernova and novae, you scan parts of the sky every few days or weeks, usually optical, and you trigger telescopes to find if you find something. With uh, gamma ray, you scan parts of the sky with gamma ray telescope. And if you find something, you trigger telescopes if you, if you find it to get spectra and other data. And with fast radio bursts, they scan the sky in radio, and they trigger other telescopes. So you see a common theme here, right? A common theme is you just scanning the sky, you find it and you trigger telescopes. But as I told you with fast radio bursts, if you trigger a telescope, you can't trigger it on it because it's already, it's already happened at shorter wavelengths. You've missed it. So what do we need to do with fast transients? They occur at all wavelengths, some at only one, some at multiple, some unknown wavelengths. So you've got to kind of probe every wavelength simultaneously. And then you need to act fast. You've got to get the data fast, process it fast, respond, trigger a telescope, that telescope's got to zip over there fast, and then you get the spectrum. So all this needs to be done in minutes once the burst happens. OK, so the challenge is you need deep observations. These things are far and faint and rare. You need wide, because you've got to search giant volumes of the universe to find them. And you need fast observations, because these things are fast. And you want to get, hopefully, more than one uh, piece of data on it. You want to like watch it evolve. And you want to do it all wavelengths. So this deep, wide, fast approach is the core of our deeper, wider, faster program. That's kind of why it was named that. And this is our logo. So it's a deeper, wider, faster program that's run out of Swinburne that, as you'll see, has lots of telescopes to do this job. And our team using the supercomputer, et cetera. So the first thing we need to do is get the data. So what we've done is we started back in 2014 and at the beginning of 2015, before there were even gravitational waves detected. We we're way back in the game. And we said, OK, we're going to take a big telescope. This is a four meter telescope with a big wide field imaging camera. And we're going to image this guy really, really fast every 20 seconds. Then we're going to take the Parkes telescope, point it at the same place in the sky, and look for FRBs. Then we're going to take the Malang Low, point it at the same part of the sky, and look for FRBs at a different frequency. Then we're going to take this Swift Space Telescope, point it at the same part of the sky, and look for gamma ray, X ray, and UV detection of anything. And so this is where they exist on Earth. DECAM's in Chile, Parkes and Malang Low in Australia, Swift is in space. So this is a Here's our plot again of the wavelengths. So we've got this area covered, and we've got this area covered, and Swift covers that. So we're doing a pretty good job. So this is our pilot survey. But the problems start to arise. You've got Chile. You've got to wait till it's nighttime to observe in the optical. So maybe about you know, around this time or so when it's night. I'll go and oh, sorry. Uh, apologies. I know you're. you're Never had so much, so many technical difficulties in a show in my life or in a talk. All right. 
so thanks for being patient. Um, so this is Chile, right? Waiting till it gets night again. And then you, and you see Parks Malonglo over here, and this is a space telescope. And so you wait till about here, and you say, okay, it's night here, you can do this in daytime, and then you have a space telescope up here. So where can you see the same parts of the sky? You actually have to look kind of you know, down here somewhere, where you can kind of point and all see the same part of the sky, which is hard, and you can only do it for a couple hours at a time and then move on to another target. So that's kind of a challenge, but we solved that. Then once you get the data, you have to process the data, and you have to do it fast. And so we need things like supercomputers, which is a fancy picture of a supercomputer. And at Swinburne, across town again, we have supercomputers that are, we, we started with the G-Star supercomputer, and now we have a new one called OzStar. These are what we use to process the data. All sounds easy, right? Okay, so the, te the optical telescopes here in Chile, you know, the supercomputer and us are here. We need to get the data from here to here fast, constantly, every 20 seconds, ideally, or minute. But the problem is there's no cable, undersea cable, to do this, and it's like, you know, gigabytes of data every minute, and that's not, if you had an internet, you know that's hard to do. And actually, what makes it worse is the data goes to Brazil, then it goes to East Coast US, West Coast US, over to Hong Kong, then over to either Guam or Singapore, and then to Perth or Sydney, and I mean, it takes a long route to get to us, and we're like, oh my goodness. So we developed ways to compress the data and creative ways to make it really small so we can get it over there faster. We, we've gotten around this problem as best we can. So after that's solved, we can get the data to the computer and process really fast with a bunch of smart students writing good code. We want to identify those things so we can trigger telescopes right away to get the spectrum. And so we started working in this room over at University of Melbourne. This is our advanced immersion environment. And it has a lot of fun things along with uh, hardworking students. And in, in short, it's a room where we process, we started processing data where we had this big screen to kind of look at a bunch of candidates, you know, hundreds at a time as we go through to say, does that even look real or not? And if it does, we send it over to people here who do a much more detailed analysis to assert, decide as fast as they can if they are real. And then if they are real and interesting, then people in this other group decide to, whether we should trigger telescopes or not. So it's this tiered process of triaging. And so it, it's worked really well. And a really quick flow chart is, the data will come to like an optical telescope like DECAM over the supercomputer in about a minute. It's processed in about a minute, then it zips over to that room. And then a whole bunch of us look at it uh, to decide what's interesting or what's not. And then we trigger a telescope somewhere else to get a spectrum. And then we also take data from high energy and radio to decide what's, what's, what to trigger on. So that's, the, that's kind of the whole process. Um, not moving. So here's how we were in 2015, as I explained, DECAM, Parks, and Longlow Swift. But since then, we grew and we've grown a lot. And in around 2016, a year later, we looked like this. We had a telescope in Antarctic doing uh, in optical observations. Gravitational wave detectors came online. We had the VLA radio telescope and MLO contributing, Gemini for spectroscopy, it's an eight meter telescope, SALT, 10 meter telescope, et cetera. So we have all these telescopes contributing to the program. So it started becoming really interesting. Here's just a quick view of them. This is SkyMapper in Australia for some wide field imaging. This is the Antarctic telescope. It, it, the beauty of this is when it's night, uh, in the winter, it's night 24 hours a day. So you just constant 24 hour coverage. There's no day. Uh, here's ADCA, which is another telescope in the compact array in Australia, which was good for imaging in radio. VLA, which people probably know about, so this is also for FRB detection. Uh, MLO, which is an optical telescope in California, was used, along with ZADCO over in Perth. Those are for like monitoring and late time monitoring of the data. There's a telescope for infrared in Chile, which is called the REM, REM telescope. The 2.3 meter, meter in Siding Spring in New South Wales, which got us inter integral field spectroscopy, which gets you spectra of the source and its host galaxy on one, which is pretty cool. And the AAT, which is a 4 meter telescope, as you know, in, uh, also at Siding Spring, which uh, we use the uh, instrument up here, which can get, it's as wide field as, the, as deck cam, which is three square degrees of the sky at a time. And it can get up to 392 spectra using fibers all at once. So in that field, when we're looking at that big field in the sky with a deck camming camera, we can find hundreds of sources that are interesting and get all of their spectra at once with this telescope, which is amazing. And then for certain targets, especially faint targets, we use things that are bigger, like 8-meter telescopes like Gemini and SALT. OK, 
Okay. And then the gravitational wave detectors are there. If they happen to find something, we try to follow it up as well. So uh, that just shows the addition of gravitational waves. All right, so then we moved our room to Swinburne where we analyzed the data in a similar type room in a similar way. This is just some snapshots of the students and other research working and people start to contribute from all over the university and online all over the world. So we have a tool that we built that analyzes the data one by one here. You can search through the data and you see this is an image of it a long time ago of that little piece of the field. This is it the, taken right minutes ago and you, and you subtract the two and you see a little source there and that says that could be something new. Gives you a little profile of it, it shows you the light curve of it, how it's changed over time, so this is time. And these things update in real time, so like a minute later another point will show up and a minute later another point will show up and you just see it evolving right there in front of your face. And you can decide if that's interesting and you can click yes or no and things like that. So that gets um, everyone all over the world that can be involved no matter where you are. And we discovered things like supernovae, here are a bunch of supernovae, their host galaxy, and that's the supernova there. So you subtract off the host galaxy, a tiny host galaxy of the supernova, a big host galaxy, and a supernova, et cetera. So these are supernovae we've discovered, some of them very early in their explosion. We've discovered Novi, and here's a galaxy somewhat nearby, 10 megaparsecs. A lot of people know NGC 6744. We discovered this Novi in there bursting, so nothing, and then it shows up. And then we discovered the fast stuff like this. So it just comes out of nowhere. So we're monitoring, this is minutes up here of time. You're monitoring the field and then there's nothing there initially and then it just, boom, just in a couple minutes shows up out of nowhere. You know, what are these kind of things? Um, here's another one which is still unknown what it is that has a tiny little eruption and then it has three bursts after this coming up. And it's, we have no idea what this thing is. And so we just, we'll keep searching and try to figure it out. So we find things like flare stars and unknown events using things like this. So these are some interesting results. And um, yeah, so it's hard to see with the way it's scaled, but hopefully you can see that first half. Okay, so this is where we were in 2016. And as I said, this has been pretty phenomenal how it's grown. And as of last year, we look something like so that's a lot of telescopes. That's almost all telescopes, <laughs> okay? So this project, this program has grown gigantic. It has telescopes at all wavelengths, all continents, and in space. From Chile to China, to the Virgin Islands, to Antarctica, to the US, Australia, in space, everywhere. It's just tells Africa, they're all over the place. Now I'm not gonna show you pictures of all these because that would just be impossible. Uh, what we do sometimes is I can show you the Pacific Coast, or, or the Pacific version of it, where we could use telescopes here, here to kind of simultaneously observe something out in space here, or maybe the Northern Hemisphere using Subaru going that way, or maybe we look at the Atlantic side, we could use telescopes here to, so you kind of piece it up depending on which direction you're all pointing. But I will show you some of the interesting ones. One is there's this uh, very high energy particle and photon detector in Argentina called PRRJ Observatory. That's part of our team. We got the uh, HXMT X-ray telescope, which has been fantastic. It's very wide field and very sensitive. We have HESS, which is in Namibia, Africa, which does gamma ray detection and it's on the ground. So what it's doing is actually detecting Trankov radiation. And if you can ask me about that later, I'll explain that to you. But it's a way of detecting gamma rays from the ground. And then we have a uh, really nice, we have the Subaru telescope in Hawaii, which is a eight meter telescope, but it has a wide field camera, which is very, very sensitive. So it goes very deep and deep into the universe. Uh, we also use the Keck telescope for some follow-up of spectroscopy through Swinburne and our collaborators. There's even a telescope at the South Pole, which is the, uh, called South Pole Telescope, creatively. Um, it's for millimeter and submillimeter detection which has uh, helped us because that's kind of the next adjacent wavelength to radio, so we think that's going to probably do some great detections. And then we've got things like the SKA Pathfinder ASCAP telescope um, out in Western Australia, the new Meerkat telescope, in, which is also part of SKA Pathfinding, which is in um, South Africa, and uh, the MWA out in Western Australia as well, which is a very low frequency radio. So you know, that's plenty of telescopes, right? To, uh, there's many more, but that's enough. So what do we cover now? Well, you know, we have these areas covered. Now we've actually widened this to all of the radio and microwave region. We've got ultra high energy way out this way. 
We've got some infrared here, and we've got the whole thing covered, basically. And so we're taking all wavelengths and particle detection and gravitational wave detection. So this is the, the picture I showed you before, back in 2014 and 2015 when we were piloting this and trying to figure it out. We coordinated these four telescopes. And you can see how that works. I explained how that coordination um, happens, where it's got to be night and chilly, et cetera. And then um, as time went on, we had, a, we had a lot more collaborators and proposed for telescope time. And now we have all of these telescopes. And this is actually about a year old. So there's about, embarrassingly, there's probably about 15 more telescopes that I can add to this. But there's, that's, this, is, this is plenty. So there's all these telescopes that can cover any part of the sky at any time. And so this is what's needed to do fast, these very, very fast transients. So this is, uh, as you can see, just everything covered, and, and it's every wavelength. So this is, this is just a, an enormous, enormous project. Here's our new, uh, I'll kind of end here with this, is our new uh, control room, mission control room at Swinburne, which is designed specifically for this. Uh, this is you know, pre one of our up runs we had recently. There's some interactive projectors here we can actually treat it like an iPad, I guess. You can move it then and mark it and do stuff, which is really nice. The walls and the things here, and we've got this, uh, all these uh, researchers working on it. They can work interactively, and we have this big discovery wall here, we call it, where it's a many, many uh, high-resolution monitors to, to analyze the data fast, and we connect with uh, people all over the world and analyze the data as it comes in. This happens about twice a year for about six days at a time. So you have like a six day, like a week, and then six months later, about a week, because it's hard to coordinate all of these telescopes and get telescope time. And so we do that, and we run it out of Swindon here. And our tools to do it have improved. I mean, this is kind of what I showed you before, but there's now added a lot more things, a lot more information. You can tell right away if it's an asteroid. You can understand its behavior much better. We have this animate button here, where these are no longer static images. They're actually movies. We can see them in action, so we can, it's easier for the eye to detect things when it's moving, you know, it, if you see it progressing. And we're actually having a, a project to actually extend this as far as we can into the unknown space of an analysis into virtual reality and augmented reality. So we want 3D goggle kind of thing to first test that to see if that helps because you need to take every piece of information you can as fast as you can. But that's also a single person experience, which is hard. And so we want to test there and then we want to go to augmented reality, which is you take off the goggles and you have something like this, glasses, it could be just a blank room, but everything's projected, and everyone sees what you see. And so you're in this room with all virtual stuff. And so you can see the whole sky in its glory, and you can zoom and move and expand and get all the data you want and, um, and explore it with everyone else to corroborate right there, because you need to decide with many people in seconds. And so this is the way we're going with that. So I invite you to participate in that because we, have a, we, haven't, we had a run recently, but we'll, our next run is probably going to be in August. It's a little ways away. But if you're interested in this and you want to just curious to see what's going on or you want to maybe discover things in real time right then yourself, contact me. You can use this tool at home, not the virtual reality one, but the other tool. And, or you can come visit us at Swinburne and I can show you around. So in summary, this is the DWF program, Deeper, Wider, Faster. It's the world's largest astronomical collaboration. There's over 65 telescopes, over 40 institutions all over the world. And now I think you might understand why it's an all-wavelength, multi-messenger, real-time, complete transient program. Hopefully you understand that phrase a little better. Um, we are on the sky simultaneously with all these wavelengths before, during, and after the burst. That's what solves this FRB thing. If you're on already with everything and you find an FRB, you just look back in your data and you see if you've discovered the counterpart. You're already there. That's the trick. And I think we're going to be the ones to do that. We process it all, all the data real time, so in seconds or minutes. We identify these things to trigger telescopes that can respond within minutes or within hours. And then finally, telescopes need, are needed to monitor the fields for those days and weeks following because many of these fast transients are associated with slower things like supernovae, and we need to understand which supernovae they are classifying. And that's where something like uh, these one meter telescopes around the world help out immensely. So you're all welcome to participate. And thank you very much for your time. And sorry for the technological delays. Thank you.
about, you talked about flare stars, Jeff. Uh, I believe my study at Monash after I retired and tutoring there, um, Prox Centauri is a flare star, and we did the calculations on it, and the flare stars are not good. If you had a planet in the habitable zone of Prox Centauri, the temperature would go up by 60 degrees Celsius a few times a day, briefly. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Not, not in even thinking about all the ionizing, the radiation particles that are going to hit that atmosphere if there's an atmosphere. So flare stars, are, flare stars are definitely death to habitable planets, at least that side of this planet that's facing it at that time, because they don't last long. But it's, it's really bad. And, and so we, a lot of people search for planets, extrasolar planets, and usually look around M stars or cool stars. And um, they've found, obviously, thousands. But if we, if we, and we're doing a census of this guy, because we can probe so deep, we can get the entire galaxy's population. And so we're trying to see what is the rate, do all of them do this, which then kind of says it's tough for those cooler stars that have life in plant. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an important thing, question to answer. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's about twice a year, and we do about a six-day run. Yeah, so it, 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 it's mostly driven by the proposal cycle for telescopes. They usually have a six-month proposal. You propose for a week, and, we usually, and because it's so hard to coordinate so many telescopes and do all this, uh, yeah, we, uh, it, you can't do it more often, really. It just becomes too expensive in time, yeah. So it's usually about twice a year. So the next one will be probably August because of how the proposal season's working and stuff. So you were talking before about fast radio bursts, something that we're interested in uh, in the um, radio astronomy section. Um, your graph showed um, frequencies around the hydrogen line. Uh, in, uh, how low in frequency would a fast radio burst be detectable? Very good question. So they have been detected by Malongolo, which is 830 megahertz. So that's quite a bit longer, but not crazy long. They have not been detected by MWA, which is like 200 megahertz. So either it's not, they're not right there, and it's just not sensitive enough, or maybe they don't emit that long. And so one of the things we're hoping to do is use uh, the compact array to get it at higher, like 5, 10 gigahertz, because I think there was one at a higher frequency like that, okay, don't quote me on that. And also to use the South Pole Telescope, which is now millimeters, so it's like 90, 150, 200 uh, gigahertz. Yeah. And to see if it's detected there, because you know what is its range? And then kind of just creep our way, is it, then does it go to the infrared, does it go to the optical at some point? You know, just, and, and, but, but depending on the physics, it might just be radio and x-ray, or it might be radio and gamma. You know, we don't know, so that's why we have to just cover the spectrum and say, you know, what do you see? In the late 50s and the 60s, the ASV had a very a, a flare star program. Um, I was only a youngster at the time, but I'm not quite sure where the observations went. Um, do you have access to historical data, or has anyone ever tried to collect what's happened in the past? No, that would, I mean, we have catalogs that we've accessed, and there's like the AABSO that has some, and there's other flare star catalogs, but I, that could be actually really valuable data. So if that's somewhere, that could be good for, yeah, it, if, it, if it had, then, then we'd have those, you know, marked that those are glaring stars. And, and the thing about them is, I mean, some of them are just really tiny, but then we have some that are just, you know, many, many magnitudes. And that's just, that's just extraordinary that a star can do that and still survive. So it's, but this flare star work is really important because even if you're monitoring in, say, optical and you see it flare, Okay. If you're monitoring in the infrared, what you notice, which is interesting, is it actually gets fainter during the flare. 
And that amount of energy lost in the infrared is equal to what's gained in the optical and like the higher energy. So it's a, it tells you a lot about what's physics are going on there. And so that's why we want to do multiple wavelengths to try to understand what these things are about. Yeah. But that data set is, yeah, we'll have to track that down. Maybe I'll talk more with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, our, our, our motto is world domination. Okay, so we want complete global control. <laughs> no, was, yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. This is fantastic. Thank you. With some more exciting discoveries. Absolutely. Maybe an FRB counterpart. <laughs> thank you very much. After Sky for the Month, uh, we'll have a decision on whether the 12-inch telescope will be open for visitors to view through. Um, if you're not familiar where that is, um, let, come to me and uh, I'll point you in the right direction. Next up, we have um, Perry, who's going to give Sky for the Month. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, everybody. Last month, I talked about Betelgeuse and how it was dimming considerably compared to previous cycles. Did anyone go out and observe it? Put your hand up. OK, well, that's a few people. The news recently is that the cycle of dimming is expected to reach minimum around the 20th, 21st, 22nd of this month. So I suggest you continue to get out there and have a look at it and see whether in fact it does uh, pick up in brightness. I think I was noting a little bit of traffic uh, on our Facebook pages and such where people were commenting on the fact that it was now only about as bright as Bellatrix. Did anyone notice it to be fainter or brighter than Bellatrix? Let's try fainter first. Did anyone see it fainter? Marginally. Okay. Um, who saw it about the same brightness as Bellatrix? <laughs> and did anyone see it brighter than Bellatrix? Okay, we're getting a little bit of consensus here. <laughs> what does one say? Uh, one ignores it and just keeps going, I think. So, there is not likely to be quite as low a minimum of Betelgeuse as this for many decades, probably, unless there's something unpredictable about to occur. So I suggest you get out there, maybe even use your cameras. Look, even my Galaxy S S10 Samsung can take a picture of um, Orion, and you can get a good comparison of it. So you don't even need fancy equipment, just regular um, camera phones will do the trick. And that will be a record to be able to compare with whether it improves in the coming weeks in brightness or not. So here it is, right there. This is Bellatrix, which is off the top of my head, magnitude plus 1.6. Did I get that right about there? 
and Betel Geese is normally one of the 20 brightest stars in the sky. What's that say? It says magnitude plus 0.43. So over a magnitude difference is highly unusual for it. Not being seen in our lifetimes, I don't believe. So keep checking it. The other star to check it with here is Aldebaran. Let's see what the mag of that is. Point, uh, plus 0 0.84. Um, and right up there at the top, of course, is Rigel, which is 0 0.15. There are many sources that you can check the magnitude of those stars and you can compare it to see if it's brighter or fainter to keep track. Now, can I drive Ken? Thank you. Can you hear me without the mic? Let's go to the western sky at sunset today and you can see the sun is setting about 22 minutes past 8 and as we're past the middle of summer now it'll be getting uh, it'll be setting, the sun will be setting earlier and earlier. For example, um, tomorrow it will set at 20 minutes past on Valentine's Day, so you know exactly when to time dinner with your loved one. Just to get sunset, it'll be 8.20. It'll be a wonderful thing, especially if you pick a restaurant or cafe somewhere along the beach. He or she will love you for it forever. So that's Valentine's Day. And gradually each day, it'll be setting uh, earlier. So... Tonight I thought we'd have a little bit of a quick look through some of the objects that we can see in the late summer sky with small telescopes. So let's advance the time. You can see stars are beginning to set. This is Mercury here. Not going to be around for much longer. Venus up a little bit higher, still in good position and will be around for another couple of months or so. But let's continue getting darker and let's head further over towards the north, north west. Over here, the Pleiades, great naked eye object, but also fantastic in binoculars, even better in a small telescope. Not so good in a large telescope because they tend to magnify too much and you don't see it all together as a single group. For example, Here's the likely view from binoculars and here's the view from a large telescope. Right? You won't see the nebulosity unless uh, you've got terrific scene conditions, but you're not going to see all of the cluster even with your lowest power eyepiece, if it's a large telescope, 
you're not going to fit all of it in the one field of view. But uh, a four inch or a three inch refractor is going to give you all of those stars probably like that. Not the nebulosity though. So quite a good thing for small telescopes, binoculars and naked eye. Of course, the Hyades cluster here with Aldebaran. In mythology, they were half-sisters to the Pleiades. The Orion Nebula right up here, which you can see with naked eye, not with all these fantastic colours, of course, but you can see it as a smudged, fuzzy little area. And Binoculars will enhance that. An 8-inch telescope will give you a great view from our dark sky site. Larger telescopes, even more so. Here is the Horsehead Nebula, but it is notoriously difficult to see, and it's got more to do with how experienced you are as an observer and less to do with how large the telescope is. But both of them play a part in it. A good rule of thumb when looking at the horse head for the first time is like Schultz used to say in Hogan's Heroes, I see nothing. Expect to see nothing and you won't be disappointed. A little bit lower down though, we've got quite a bit of action and some nice stuff. About here, if we centre that, is the Crab Nebula, which is Messier 1. The horns of the bull extend from here, from his eye, up to there, to Zeta in one of them, and to El Nath here in the other just below Zeta is where the horse head is. Uh, sorry, the crab nebula is. Now, again, not a particularly well defined object, but in an 8 inch from our dark sky site, you can expect to see a slightly zigzagged type of shape, which is the nebula. Again, don't expect to see too much detail, and it is small. You will not see any colour. Not visually, at least. Um, something which is overlooked a lot in Orion, because it's overshadowed by its much better known counterpart, which is M42. That is M78, which is a ghostly nebula. And the way to find it, because it's not very obvious, is to take a line from this part of the saucepan, and the saucepan is made up, of course, of the belt stars being the bottom, the handle goes across there, and there's the other side. So from Algeba there, take a line through Al Nilam and extend it as far, and right about there you hit M78. So let's centre it and see if I'm making stuff up or whether it's really there. No, it really is there. So, a lot of these things you can find by using other stars to help you get to the general area. And don't forget, visually, always, mind you, always begin with your lowest power eyepiece, which is going to give you a 
the widest possible view because even if you're not dead on the object, it's not going to be far away. So you can just wiggle the field of view around a little bit one way or the other and it should pop out. Now, a similar thing, where are we? Happens with some other objects. <coughs> um, up here in Canis Major, the big dog, and the, big, the dog is lying on its back. There's the front leg, serious marks, the breastbone. The, are we all adults here tonight? Do we have any young ones? We do? Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say this is the bum of the dog, but now I won't. Um, this is the back leg, and this is the tail of the dog. But right about here, almost where you'd expect to find the stomach, is where we've got M41, a fabulous little cluster of stars. Again, you can just make it out as a hazy patch with binoculars. With a small telescope, you'll see this collection of beautiful little stars. Now, using Sirius and the Bum Star, if you make an isosceles triangle and point downwards, the tip of that isosceles triangle has two other beautiful Messier clusters, M46 and M47, right about here somewhere. So what you do is you centre it and you zoom in and you get the object, there's M47, which kind of reminds me a little bit of Orion. There's three stars in the middle, bright one at one end and a bright one at the other end. And that's a nice cluster, but a fainter cluster, however richer and with an extra object therein, is this one, M. 46, and there's a planetary nebula in it right there as well, contained within that cluster. So two for the price of one there. Some more clusters in this part of the sky. Over this way we have M93, another good object from Messier's catalogue, and if we zoom into there, there it is. Beautiful cluster. Closer to the northern horizon, we're now below Orion, and over here we have Capella that Mazda, if you all recall, named a car after it. Does anyone remember the Mazda Capella? Anyone have one? No? Good thing too, because they were terrible cars. Uh, yes, they were great at going, but not so good at stopping. Um, anyhow, Along the Milky Way here, we have a number of Messier clusters. We've got M38 closest to the bottom, closer to the horizon. There it is. Again, great in a small telescope. M36 just a little bit to its right and higher. Not as rich, but still worth having a look at. And further along is M37.
again another beautiful rich cluster a little bit further along towards the east at the foot of Gemini right about here is another Messier object M35 and in fact this is not too far from where the planet Uranus was discovered by William Herschel on the 13th of March in 1781, I believe. And this is a fantastic cluster because even though it's not depicted in this program, there is a smaller, more distant cluster just on its edge. And an eight inch telescope from our dark sky site should begin to show you that in all its glory. Um, a little bit further on, we have this sort of quadrilateral or trapezoidal shape of stars which designates a faint zodiacal constellation which is Cancer, probably the faintest one of the lot. But right smack in the middle of it is the beautiful M44 or the Beehive Cluster right there. And you can see that naked eye from the dark sky site, not as brightly as what you will see the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, but still you should be able to see it with naked eye if your eyes are normal. Now, quickly moving to the southern sky, it's very soon in the next two or three months going to become very much in the Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck tradition. It's going to be ducks. No, it's going to be emu season. Now watch the emu rising up from the horizon. See if you can spot it as we advance the time. Let me know if you can see it. It's made up of no stars. There it is. The head and the beak is the coal sack just below the Southern Cross right there. The neck is made up of the dark patches of the Milky Way going through the pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri or right Regal Centaurus and Hadar as it's depicted here and the body of it runs through Scorpius, through the tail, and later in the evening, it also keeps going through Sagittarius, which is the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. Also, a couple of stray patches of the Milky Way here, or what look like stray patches of the Milky Way, are the large and small Magellanic clouds. Again, you can easily see these with naked eye from our dark sky site. Steve, how are we going for time? Uh, yeah, we do, <laughs> we do. <laughs> Two minutes, all right, very quickly. Um, I'll point out one a couple of other objects that are worth noting in this part of the sky now. One is going to be Omega Centauri 5139, which is a fantastic globular cluster. As we all know, the biggest 
in the whole of the sky and best placed for us to see. And the other object, if it's on here a little bit further on, because it was mentioned by Barry and also by Jeff, is Proxima Centauri. Now it's 11th magnitude and really difficult to see, but let's see if we can find it. Damn, it's not enough. Give me more time. Mr. Scott, get her up to speak. Um, well, I'll tell you what I do to find it normally. This star is Alpha Zerkini. This is Regal Centaurus, as we said, Alpha Centauri and Beta Centauri. If you take a halfway line between these two, which is about there, and run it back to Alpha Sakini, then about halfway, right about there, is where you would expect to find here it is, I've got my guide stars See this little triangle and an extra one at the tip? Well, that points to this other star here, which is over 8th magnitude, and that would be the brightest star in the field. At, say, 60 times, you would see all of that much. Now, let's run it up a little bit brighter, and if you run back towards this other little trio of stars there, I'll point to them, to on the way over there, the brightest star is this one, and that is Proxima Centauri, right there. All right. I'll call it quits there. Thank you for your attention. Good effort. Under pressure too. Yes, one minute or less. <laughs> Try to do that in the telescope. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have a few announcements. Um, we have the library announcement first. He will give you a rundown on what's available lately in the library. I'll keep it brief, don't worry. <laughs> uh, you will have seen crux all the additions to the library tonight, which starts with the uh, field guide of the planets, a uh, great course set of lectures. That's our 36th one, and there's a 37th one going to the library in April. I'll tell you about later. But uh, one interesting thing is they're the I'll keep this very brief. Uh, down to the donated items. Where are we? Where are we? Hang on. Here we are. There's two DVs donated by Pat Larkin and Louisa Cleons, our daughter. <laughs> and the interesting point, the book generously donated by Swinburne if you just mention up there, is this one. Extreme explosions. I mentioned it, yeah. Supernovae and other things. Like that by David Stevenson. He's from Swinburne too, Jeff. Where's Jeff? Yeah, right? And it covers some of the things you were talking about, I think, that book. And if you just happen to be a fluke, if you donate, we put it in the library tonight. It was just a fluke, but there it is. That became the library, and that's got things in it that Jeff was talking about, I believe. Yeah. 
you know driving streams from like this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, look, I'll, I'll keep it brief because we... Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Do we have any other section announcements? Do we have any other slides? Ken? Did uh, it? Okay, good. Uh, Rod, what's the viewing prospects like? It's overpassed. Oh, okay. For anyone who wishes to go look through the uh, Society's 12 inch telescope at the Melbourne Observatory, um, we're going to open up tonight after the meeting, so after you have had a quick bite to eat with supper and uh, a drink, um, feel free to wander down and have a look. Uh, there are no further announcements. Um, next month we're going to have two of our sections get up and ply their trade and explain to the new members um, what they're all about and what they can achieve from them. From time to time we're going to have our sections up here presenting so that members can get a better understanding as to what goes on in their sections. So thank you all for attending. I invite you out to get some beverages and the supper is coming out there. So if we could have someone to help Gavin out there to pour the water and such, that would be great. Right, thank you people.